A Retrospect by Hudson Taylor, Chapter 8, Voyage to China. Soon after this time, so long looked forward to arrive, the time that I was to leave England for China. After being set apart with many prayers for the ministry of God's word among the heathen Chinese, I left London for Liverpool. And on the 19th of September, 1853, a little service was held in the stern cabin of the Dumfries, which had been secured for me by the committee of the Chinese Evangelization Society under whose aspects I was going to China. My beloved now sainted mother had come to see me off from Liverpool. Never shall I forget that day, nor how she went with me into the little cabin that was to be my home for nearly six long months. With a mother's loving hand, she smoothed the little bed. She sat by my side and joined me in the last hymn that we should sing together before the long parting. We knelt down and she prayed the last mother's prayer I was to hear before starting for China. Then notice was given that we must separate, and we had to say goodbye, never expecting to meet on earth again. For my sake, she restrained her feelings as much as possible. We parted, and she went on shore, giving me her blessing. I stood alone on deck, and she followed the ship as we moved towards the dock gates. As we passed through the gates, the separation really commenced. I shall never forget the cry of anguish wrought from that mother's heart. It went through me like a knife. I never knew so fully until then what God so loved the world meant. And I am quite sure that my precious mother learned more of the love of God to the perishing in that hour than in all her life before. Oh, how it must grieve the heart of God when he sees his children indifferent to the needs of the wide world for which his beloved, his only begotten son, died. Hearken, O daughter, and consider, and incline thy ear. Forget also thine own people and thy father's house. Show shall the king's desire thy beauty, for he is thy lord, and worship thou him. Praise God, the number is increasing, who are finding out the exceeding joys, the wondrous revelations of his mercies vouchsafed to those who follow him and empty in themselves, leave all in obediency to his great commission. It was on the 19th of September, 1853, that the dumb fry sailed for China, and not until the 1st of March in the spring of the following year did I arrive in Shanghai. Our voyage had a rough beginning, but many had promised to remember us in constant prayer. No small comfort was this, for we had scarcely left the um, Marcy when a violent equinoctial gale caught us, and for 12 days we were beaten backwards and forwards in the Irish Channel, unable to get out to sea. The gale steadily increased, and, and after almost a week we lay to for a time, but drifting on a lee coast, we were compelled again to make sail and, and endeavor to beat off to windward. The utmost efforts of the captain and crew, however, were unavailing, and Sunday night, 25th September, found us drifting into Carnivoy Bay, each task becoming shorter, until at last we were within stone's throw of the rocks. About this time, as the ship, which had refused to stay, was put round in the other direction, the Christian captain said to me, We cannot live half an hour now. What have you called to your labor for the Lord in China? I had previously passed through a time of much conflict, but that was over, and it was a great joy to feel and to tell him that I would not, for any consideration, be in any other position, that I strongly expected to reach China, but that if otherwise at any rate the master would say it was well, that I was found seeking to obey his command. Within a few minutes after wearing, the ship captain walked up to the compass and said to me, The wind has freed two points. We shall be able to beat out of the bay. And so we did. The bow sprit was sprung, and the vessel seriously strained. But in a few days we got out to sea, and necessary repairs were so thoroughly effected on board that our journey to China was in due time satisfactorily accomplished. One thing was a great trouble to me that night. I was a very young believer and had not sufficient faith in God to see him in and through the use of means. I had felt in a duty to comply with the earnest wish of my beloved and honored mother, and for her sake to procure a swimming belt. But in my own soul I felt as if I could not simply trust in God while I had this swimming belt. And my heart had no rest until on that night, after all hope of being saved was gone, I had given it away. Then I had perfect peace, and strange to say, put several light things together likely to float at the time we struck, without any thought of inconsistency or scruple. 
ever since, I have seen clearly the mistake I made, a mistake that is very common in these days when erroneous teaching on faith healing does much harm, misleading some as to the purposes of God, shaking the faith of others and distressing the minds of many. The use of means ought not to lessen our faith in God, and our faith in God ought not to hinder our using whatever means He has given us for the accomplishment of His purposes. For years after this, I always took a swimming belt with me, and never had any trouble about it, for after the storm was over, the question was settled for me through the prayerful study of the Scriptures. God gave me then to see my mistake, probably to deliver me from a great deal of trouble on similar questions now so constantly raised. When in medical or surgical charge in any case, I have never thought of neglecting to ask God's guidance and blessing in the use of appropriated means, nor yet of omitting to give Him thanks for answered prayer and restored health. But to me it would appear as presumptuous and wrong to neglect the use of those measures which He Himself has put within our reach, as to neglect to take daily food and suppose that life and health might be maintained by prayer alone. The voyage was a very tedious one. We lost a good deal of time on the equator from Combs, and when we finally reached the eastern um, archipelago, which again detained with the same cause, usually a breeze would spring up soon after sunset and last until about dawn. The utmost use was made of it, but during the day we lay still with the flapping sails, often drifting back and losing a good deal of the advantage we had gained during the night. This had happened notably on one occasion when we were in the dangerous proximity to the north of New Guinea. Saturday night had brought us to a point some 30 miles off the land, but during the Sunday morning service which was held on deck, I could not fail to notice that the captain looked troubled and frequently went over to the side of the ship. When the service was ended, I learned from him the cause. A four-knot current was carrying us rapidly uh, towards some sunken reefs, and we were already so near that it seemed improbable that we should get through the afternoon in safety. After dinner, the long boat was put out, and all hands endeavored without success to turn the ship's head from the shore. As we drifted nearly, we could plainly see the natives rushing about the sands and lighting fires ever here and there. The captain's horn book informed him that these people were cannibals, so that our position was not a little alarming. After standing together on the deck for some time in silence, the captain said to me, Well, we have done everything that, we can, that can be done. We can only await the result. A thought occurred to me, and I replied, No, there is one thing we have not yet done. What is it? he queried. Four of us on board are Christians, I answered, the Swedish carpenter and our colored steward, with the captain and myself. Let us each retire to his own cabin, and in agreed prayer ask the Lord to give us immediately a breeze. He can as easily send it now as at sunset. The captain complied with this proposal. I went and spoke to the other two men, and after prayer with the carpenter, we all four retired to wait upon God. I had a good but very brief session in prayer, and then felt so satisfied that our request was granted that I could not continue asking, and very soon went up again on deck. The first officer, a godless man, was in charge. I went over and asked him to let down the claws or corners of the mainsails, which had been drawn up in order to lessen the useless flapping of the sail against the rigging. He answered, What would be the good of that? I told him we had been asking a wind from God, that it was coming immediately, and we were so near the reef by this time that there was not a minute to lose. With a look of incredibility and contempt, he said with an oath that he would rather see a wind than hear of it. But while he was speaking, I watched his eye and followed it up to the royal, the topmost sail. And there, sure enough, the corner of the sail was beginning to tremble in the, um, in the coming breeze. Don't you see the wind is coming? Look at the royal, I exclaimed. No, it is only a cat's paw, he, re he rejoined, a mere puff of wind. Cat's paw or not, I cried, pray, let down the mainsail and let us have the benefit. This he was not slow to do. In another minute, the heavy trend of the men on the deck brought up the captain from his, his cabin to see what was the matter and he saw the breeze had indeed come. In a few minutes we were plowing our way at six or seven knots an hour through the water, and the multitude of naked savages whom we had seen on the beach had no wreckage that night. We were soon out of danger, and though the wind was sometimes unsteady, we did not altogether lose it until after passing the Pibu Islands. And thus God encouraged me, ere landing on China's shores, to bring every variety of need to him in prayer, and to expect that he would honor the name of the Lord Jesus and give the help which each emergency required.